All right, so this is the first of our lectures for the thorax chapter. And we're going to begin with the thoracic cage. So here's a picture of the thoracic cage, both from an anterior and a posterior uh, point of view. So anterior and posterior. And in the anterior view, you can see you have um, 12 sets of ribs on each side, and they join here in the sternum. And then in the posterior view, they kind of stem off of the thoracic vertebrae here. And one thing to note about the thoracic vertebrae is, is you, this is a diagram does a good job illustrating it, is the thoracic vertebrae don't really move too much. They don't have, you know, a tendency to have degenerative uh, osteoarthritis or degenerative disease in here like in the lumbar or cervical spine, which undergoes a lot of motion. The thoracic vertebrae doesn't really go under much motion, and that's because of these ribs uh, stemming out from them and kind of holding them in place. So, kind of some basic osteology of the thoracic vertebrae. So, just like in kind of your run-of-the-mill vertebrae, you get a body here, and then you have the pedicles that stem out like here, and then the lamina that come in here like this, and then the spinous process. Um, you have your transverse processes coming out this way. And what's unique about the thoracic vertebrae is that they have these kind of facets here um, to join with the ribs, because the ribs will be kind of coming out from the body here. And they kind of articulate, and the ribs kind of have a little knob here that kind of articulates with the thoracic vertebrae. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then also they have these superior and inferior articular uh, processes here and here that kind of form that shingle or stacking uh, uh, structure of the vertebrae. Just that you know this is common structures throughout the vertebrae. And the thoracic vertebrae, if you remember, it has a um, kyphotic shape. And if you remember, that means the con, you know, concave from the anterior, convex from the posterior um, view, and so that's a, that's the natural shape of it, and it's exaggerated in patients with osteoporosis. And what happens is, is in osteoporosis, you know, you have loss of, um, you know, your bone mass in here because of decreased calcium and vitamin D, and so you have loss of structure. And so these vertebrae become very weak, and they tend to shift out this way. And they kind of sh they that's what kind of gives that hunchback um, look. This is a very exaggerated line, but just to give you the idea. And so, in you know, especially in older women who haven't had their osteoporosis properly managed, you'll see them kind of you know the, the sweet old lady kind of hunched over her you know cane or walker, and she kind of has the this humpback or her you know kind of this upper bump in her in her back, and that's due to her thoracic vertebrae kind of kind of forming this you know exaggerated kyphotic shape. Um, so the vertebral bodies, like we said, here's a kind of a sagittal view of it. You have this transverse processes here, and these are what form um, an articulation with the rib. And then on the body here, you can see an articulation structure here that kind of serves as an anchoring point. So the, the vertebrae really, they, they shoot off of the body. They also kind of have, they articulate with the transverse process here, and that stabilizes it. And then they kind of go and wrap around and then join with the sternum in the anterior portion of the cage. And what's important to note here is that the rib articulates with the thoracic vertebrae twice, both on the body and at the transverse process. So that's important to know. All right, so here we're going to jump to the skeleton to show you the costal vertebral joint in three dimensions. So if we zoom in on one of these joints here, so if we look at this, this is the eighth rib here. What it does is it articulates with the uh, T8 body, so thoracic vertebrae 8 uh, body, and then it also articulates with the disc between T8 and T7. So this is the T7 vertebrae. So you have the head of the rib articulating with the same vertebrae uh, numbered as the rib, and then also the vertebrae above it, which in this case is T7, and then also the intervertebral di uh, disc. So the rib kind of extends up and articulates with both uh, vertebrae. Then you have the costotransverse joint, which is also shown here and as we showed in the other diagram, and that is where the rib articulates with the transverse process of the same numbered uh, vertebrae. So T8 vertebrae, eighth rib. And then now for the sternum, which is kind of the point where all the ribs come together, it's a, it's a three, uh, it's three separate bones that form the sternum, and so you have the manubrium here superiorly, you have the body of the, of the sternum here, and then you have the xiphoid process here, and what's, a, what's an important, I guess, anatomical landmark, very important, very high yield, both useful on, in anatomy classes and both useful in the real world, in the operating room and in the clinics, 
is the sternal angle, which is right here, which is where the manubrium joins the body of the sternum. And so what's important about this is it has it's a lot it's a, it's a lot of different structures that f kind of pass by here or form here. And the first one to note is this is where the second rib comes in. So what's important to know about that is is you can kind of use this as a landmark, you know, if let's say you wanted to oscillate, you know, the aortic valve, which is what you would do in the in the right second intercostal space. You could if, if you had trouble, you could feel for the sternal angle and just go right here. Same thing for pulmonic valve in the left intercostal second intercostal space. So it's a good point to know where the rib. Let's say you're doing a surgery where you need to go through, you know, um, let's say the fourth and fifth rib here. You could feel for the sternal angle, then you'll feel the second rib when you're um, when you're you know prepping the patient and then you'll feel the second rib and you can count three four and then you know you're at the fourth rib and you want to go below that at the fourth intercostal space so that's another useful of it use uh, use of it um, it's also the landmark of the intervert intervertebral disc between t4 and t5 um, not it's not a landmark for either of the vertebrae it's the ver landmark for the disc in between it's also a landmark of if we kind of clear this here if you were to draw a line through here, it marks kind of the you know barrier between the middle and superior mediastinum, which we'll talk about in subsequent lectures. And what's more important about that is it's kind of the beginning of the aortic arch. So the aortic root kind of comes off like this, and then it starts to form the arch here just above. So it's kind of marks, and then the arch comes back down like this, and then it come, becomes the descending aorta. So the, above the sternal angle, the aorta is considered the aortic arch. If you go proximally here, just below it, it's the ascending aorta. If you go distally here below the, it's the descending aorta, which then goes down all the way into the abdomen. And we'll talk about that in subsequent lectures. What's also important to know is if we clear it again, so here's our sternal angle, is it's also the point where the trachea bifurcates. So if you have your trachea coming down here, this is where they're going to kind of split off into those main primary bronchi. And again, we'll talk about the respiratory tree in subsequent lectures. But it's when you're thinking about these these structures in, in you know in various lectures or when you're studying is you want to keep this anatomical landmark in mind because it's a kind of a you know a passageway point or a junction point where a lot of different structures form or pass so very important and now you have the xiphoid process down here kind of the most inferior portion and it's at the same level as the t10 vertebrae and then if you if you can palpate this in an individual um, it's it'll be a landmark for the t6 dermatome now, what it's really useful clinically is it's used as a, as a landmark because, again, you can palpate it for pericardiosynthesis. And now, what in the world is that? That's a procedure, and it's typically done by um, cardiothoracic surgeons. And what they'll do is they'll palpate the xiphoid process here, and they'll know to go just lateral to it, and then go underneath the costal margin, which is this kind of this border formed by all these ribs fusing together. We'll talk a little bit about that later, but that's what the costal margin is. And so they'll slip the needle um, just lateral to the xiphoid process and underneath the costal margin. And then they'll put it into, now there's like, what we'll get into later is there's kind of a sac around the heart called a pericardial sac. And let's say you have your heart in here like this. Now what can happen is, is you can have blood build up in here, fluid could build up in here. And what that's called is, is a cardiac tamponade. And what's that? That's just a fancy word for blood or fluid really just fluid building up around the heart and so what happens is if this builds up too fast too quickly is it can compress the heart and be fatal so what you want to do is stick a needle in there as soon as possible and drain that fluid out um, another thing to note is since the sternum can be palpated and it's just under the skin is you is it's used by hematologists um, to for a bone marrow biopsy and so really as I said it's subcutaneous it's easily accessible because it's right here in the center. It's right under the surface. You don't have to stick it in deep. And the bone marrow within the sternum maintains hematopoietic activity into, into late adulthood. And so that's important. It's an easy to access bone. And then you also, because not all the bones that were active during childhood for hematopoiesis are active in adulthood. And so that, that can serve as significance. You'll know that you'll get a good sample from here. Now, for the ribs, there's 12 pairs of ribs, so uh, 12 ribs on each side, and they're classified into three categories, um, the true ribs, the false ribs, and the floating ribs. All right, so we're jumping back to the skeletal model here, and we're going to do this to show you the different types of ribs. 
And the reason for this is we think we'll, you know, this will be better appreciated on our 3D model than just on a 2D diagram. And so if you look at the true ribs, which are these ribs here, one through seven, they each have their own articular point, cartilaginous articular point with the sternum. And so they don't share. There's no fusion as like there is going down here. And so what's going on down here is ribs eight through 10 are the false ribs and they form this single cartilaginous structure that then articulates with the sternum right here. So they share a cartilaginous articular, articulation point with the sternum. And if you'll notice, they also, by forming this cartilaginous structure, they form what's called the costal margin, that, that landmark we were talking about earlier with the pericardiocentesis. So you have your xiphoid process here in your sternal body, and then you have the costal margin, which goes down here. And this is something, especially in thin individuals, can be palpated, and it can use, you know, on the left side here to find the spleen, which is back in here. And then on the right side can be used to find the, to help you find the liver and palpate the liver uh, on physical exam. And so that's what's important there. And one last comment to make from uh, this view of the skeleton is to talk about the concept of the intercostal spaces, which is uh, a concept used clinically all the time. And there's a certain convention. And so the intercostal spaces are the spaces between the ribs, just like this, all the way down. And the way they're numbered is, is they're numbered for the space um, for the, the rib superior to the space. So this is the first intercostal space here because you have the first rib here, second rib here. And then second intercostal space here, third intercostal space here, because third rib, third intercostal space, fourth rib, fourth intercostal space, and then so on. And one way that you can help to remember that is, you know, above the first rib, there's no intercostal space. That's one way you can remember. Another thing is, is, is when we go more into the physical exam that's kind of relevant for the anatomy is you oscillate the heart valves, the pulmonic valve here in the second intercostal space, and then here, just below that sternal angle we were talking about. Uh, in the previous slides. And so you can remember that this is the second intercostal space just below the sternal angle where the second, ar second rib articulates. And to close this out, the last two ribs, the 11th and 12th, are the, f are the floating ribs. So 11 and 12 here. And the reason for that is it's pretty obvious if you look at it here is they kind of, they float out here. They don't articulate with the sternum. They don't have cartilaginous insertion points. They just kind of float out here on their own. So something else to point out from this uh, side view is what's called the costal groove, which is this groove that kind of runs underneath the rib here. And it's, it's a kind of a uh, depression in the rib, in the inferior surface of the rib, where the, uh, the neurovascular structure, so the you know, intercostal arteries, the intercostal veins, intercostal nerves, it kind of serves as a protection. So they travel just underneath the, the uh, rib here in the costal groove. And what's important about that is if you're gonna do any kind of diagnostic like thoracentesis, which is a procedure involving sticking a needle into the thoracic cage, you know, to drain, you know, fluid that accumulates or blood. You don't want to go below the rib like this because you risk hitting the artery or the nerve. So you want to go above the rib like this. All right, and what I was just showing you there on the skeleton is the, um, the costal groove, which is where the um, neurovascular bundle uh, travels. And so here's kind of a diagram or a cartoon to show that. And so here's your rib, and you have your neurovascular bundle here, so your vein, artery, nerve. And here's your costal groove here. So that's your costal groove. And it kind of serves as kind of a protection for these important structures. And so superior to inferior, you know, you have it's vein, artery, nerve. And a mnemonic for that is VAN. Um, so vein, artery, and then nerve. Uh, and then to kind of close this out, we have the, inter just talk a little bit about the intercostal nerves. Now, what are they? So, again, we talked about how they travel in this costal groove. And then show this diagram here will show you that, what they are is the anterior primary rami of the first 11 thoracic spinal nerves. And so as you can see here is the spinal nerves coming off the spinal cord in the thoracic region. And then they run in the costal groove, inferior surface of the rib, and they terminate as both the lateral cutaneous and anterior cutaneous um, and muscular branches as well. And so the branches that kind of innervate the intercostal muscles. And so that's the three places where they'll terminate. And what they'll do is provide skin innervation kind of to the side, you know, the lateral region of the, of the you know, thorax, and then the anterior cutaneous portion of the, of the thorax. Um, and then as far as muscular innervation, they innervate the intercostal muscles, the subcostalis muscle, and the transversus thoracis muscle. And these are muscles that we'll talk about that, you know, are kind of involved in breathing and maintaining the, the structure of the thoracic cage. And then, like I talked about, they provide the continuous innervation.
um, intercostal arteries. They also run the costal groove that we talked about. They supply the muscles of the intercostal space and the adjacent structures. Um, so the skin in that region, the muscles in that region. Um, and the anterior intercostal arteries, they branch off of either the internal thoracic artery or the musculophrenic artery. So they can branch off either one of those. So that's the anterior. The posterior intercostal arteries, they branch directly off the thoracic aorta. So that's these guys coming off here. As you can see here in this diagram, it's kind of a view from the side. So here's your aorta, and this is the descending aorta with still within the thoracic cage, and you have these posterior intercostals coming off. Now, what happens is, is you have an anastomosis that forms between the anterior and the posterior intercostals. And the, the reason this exists is it's to provide a collateral circulation for the viscera and muscles of the thorax. Um, so if one of the arteries, if you have a blockage or some kind of impingement on one of the arteries, you can, you can still get blood flow where it needs to go, and these anastomoses in the intercostal arteries can, play, can help that along. Now, for the intercostal veins, they drain in the intercostal spaces like we talked about, and they follow the same course as the intercostal arteries. Nothing really to note beyond that. And that closes out our first lecture for the thorax, the thoracic cage.